All right, I think we are live, everyone. Welcome to Coffee in Campaign Building on PhD and D on YouTube. I hope the sound quality is good. I hope the video quality is good. I had some issues setting everything up, so uh, definitely leave a comment if for some reason something is not working. But we will get started. So coffee and campaign building, a little introduction for you is where we get coffee or drink of your choice, whatever's going to make you the most creative. And we're going to sit down and do some campaign building. I will talk about my own world building, the setting that I'm working on, and we will actually do some world building. And I've designed a few exercises today so that hopefully you can world build alongside me and work on whatever your setting is doing the same things, kind of like a guided world building exercise, if you will. So if you don't have a drink, get one. If you are able to watch this live, we are having the Q&A app open so you can join the conversation as it says, and you can post questions because as we go along and later in the broadcast, I will actually go through and answer some questions. I've got kind of a good setup of what we're going to do today. It's a little bit more organized than I've been in the past. So this should I blinds you when I do that, but I plan on doing a lot of screen shares uh, during this broadcast, so it won't be a lot of my mug in your face. So without further ado, let's get started. So the introduction, like I said, this is a series where we just get together creatively and world build. I've had a lot of people wanting me to talk more about my home setting that I'm working on. So I will use this as an outlet to talk a little bit about that and things that I've built and then try to relate them into something useful for you and how you can apply that to your own world building and your own setting. So again, drinks are required. So let me know in the comments what you are drinking during this. So first off, let me do just a little bit of a recap on my world building, what I've done uh, recently. So I've been doing a lot of maps, uh, obviously a lot of maps. I have a Patreon page now where every week I publish a free map for tabletop RPGs. Most of the time, obviously, they're going to be geared towards fantasy games like Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder. But you can check that out. As I said, they're always free. You do get some perks if you join as a patron and a couple of the patrons actually dictate the type of material that's coming out and we'll actually show you another one of the perks they get later in this video uh, where they actually get a design an npc so we'll go through that and i'll show you one but i've been doing a lot of maps for that and a lot of maps for my actual campaign so i'm going to show you some of those as we go along and show you how you can always refer back to your maps to really help you stay on track with your world building um, but yeah, maps recently fleshing out the city that the campaign's going to start in or the town because I've got this bigger picture setting, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but I want to now focus in since the campaign will start in probably a month, um, maybe a little more, but I want to actually focus in on where they're starting. You don't want to flesh out your entire world, every single detail before the campaign begins because you want to allow the campaign to guide the building of the world. And that is a major thing that I think a lot of people overlook, especially new DMs or new people running a game for the first time maybe. They want to build everything out or they think they have to build every last detail out and that's just simply not the case. So anyways, that's what I've done with mine so far. I've focused in on that town, which I will show you later in this episode. But to give you kind of a rundown of exactly what we are going to do, we are going to actual details. What is the candle or setting? What makes it different than other settings in the genre? And what have I done with it? Then we're going to talk about kind of my overview process of world building because it's constantly evolving. So a quick talk there. Then we'll get to what I call relations among nations. 
Candelure actually has seven kingdoms, as you'll see. And so we're going to do a world building exercise uh, with everyone that's watching can kind of follow along for their own world building. But we're going to talk about how do each how does each nation relate to the others or for your game it might be how does this city relate to this city and so on uh, after that we're going to take a closer look at an actual city the starting city for the candler campaign so you can see exactly what i'm doing with a city what am i putting together what details do i have written out uh, so we'll take a close look at that city and then we'll zoom in even further and take a close look at an npc or two just to give you an idea there. And as we go along and at the end, I will also leave time for questions. I do have a few questions backed up from emails and messages, but also feel free to jump in the Q&A app and toss your question on there because I will answer hopefully all of those or as many as I possibly can during this. So let's move on to the Candelure overview. I've had a lot of messages uh, where people want to learn more about the setting that I'm working on. And so that's what I'm going to take the time to do for five, 10 minutes here is talk about what is the setting, what makes it different than other settings, what was the inspiration behind it. And so that's what we'll do. Candelure is two land masses, essentially. And I'm going to actually, I'll screen share a map here in a second, but it's made up of seven different kingdoms called the Shattered kingdoms actually at a point where there are tensions between a lot of them they've got very interesting relations which we'll go over later in this video but kind of the inspiration behind this actual setting was more of a a uh, it started i guess you could say i wanted a different setting than air air is a campaign uh, that i built where it started out very low magic and that was a lot of fun but i wanted some higher fantasy or more magic added to it and so this started out as as that now the major video games that have influenced candelure the two biggest are reckoning kingdoms of amalur see where i get the name or influenced by it and world of warcraft was actually a big influencer later on because i only started playing that a few months ago but if, i took a few ideas from that but those have been major influences. Now, smaller influences, obviously, uh, Forgotten Realms, um, uh, Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire, Westeros. That's been a very small influence. The setting is nothing like that, but I liked certain things from that setting. And so I used those to kind of mold this. So that was the inspiration for Candelure. Next, let me screen share a map. Okay, we should be good. Sometimes my screen share freezes up, so hopefully you can see everything. Ignore the giant circle. That will be what I use to highlight some stuff. But this is the third map of Candelure. There were three, or I should say there were two separate revisions. I have a video on that on my channel on revising a map and kind of the steps or the evolution of this map. This is what I've settled on. And so we're going to go through and I'm going to show you where each of the kingdoms is. So we start out with Alheim, which is this area. Now, Alheim is it's known as the ancient kingdom of dwarves and men. Dwarves and men have lived pretty much in harmony with one another in this area. They get that whole north to south area over there. Now, it's very mountainous. Obviously, they have a lot of coastlines as well. Up towards the north, it's very cold, um, actually snow covered at the very north. But this is where those very ancient races started in this area. And they are very, very proud of their culture and very, very proud of what they have so they're very tough to deal with if you are another kingdom or nation so next up we're going to move to a smaller one oops right over here this little mountain range up towards the top 
is actually the kingdom of Aramanthir. This kingdom has been around a very long time. It is a mixture of a lot of races. So I can't say, you know, this is the elven kingdom or something like that. It is more of a, a, I would say progressive, but you'll see that there's much more progressive than this. So let's start with this. They were taken over at one point by a demon lord, and they didn't know it until he basically was running the entire nation or kingdom. So from there on out, they distrusted men, and they elected to have a queen be the ruler because this young noble came up through the ranks and took over as king and they turned out to be a demon lord. So we're going to go with queens in the future and trust females to make better decisions than men have. So that is run by a queen and it always will be. Now, they actually separated. The first queen of Aramanthir actually founded another kingdom next to it called Arathel, which is this area. Dragonborn known as Azrul, invaded Candelure a long time ago. They failed to take over for various reasons. And they, then they were kind of scattered to the wind. You know, where did these dragonborn belong? No one wanted them because they were invading. And so the queen of Aramanthir said, we're going to create a kingdom where they are welcome. Um, and then Aramanthir kind of oversaw that kingdom. And they have very close relations with Arathel. But Arathel is going to have a mixture of races. A lot of the half-breeds end up there just because it's kind of a welcoming place for despised races, um, Dragonborn, and so on and so forth. Next, we actually move to where the campaign begins, and that is the Kingdom of Kendarathane, this middle bulge or island, not island, this middle part of the continent is Kindarathane. This is the land of the elves. This is, there's two mountainous uh, chains here. It's hard to see because it's not in color. And there's another one here. And then a huge forest known as the Forest of the Ancients. And then a smaller one here on what's known as the Cradled Coast. So this is where the campaign will actually start. The ancient races from here, the Moon Elves, which are as old or older than the Kingdom of Alheim, they started here. Eladrin came from the Feywild, and they settled here. But those are going to be the two major races in this kingdom. Now, as you'll see later in this video, there's a city called Destiny's Point. It's right in the middle. It's actually not a part of Kendarathane, or it's not governed by the elves because it is a, it's a long, something known as the Red Road, which is a trade road going all the way through Candelure. So this city exists as a stopping point or trading point within uh, Kendarathane that the elves just kind of let them do their thing. As long as they're not coming off into the rest of their realm, they let people travel along that road and rest and stay in Destiny's Point. Next up, we're going to move to Stormfall, which is in this region over here. Stormfall was a group of humans and dwarves that left Alheim. When, when the Azrul, or the Dragonborn, came to Candelur, they imprisoned the gnomes. They enslaved the gnomes, and these people did not appreciate that. They wanted to go free the gnomes because they didn't want anyone in Candelure enslaved. The kingdom of Alheim, the elders there, they didn't care. They said, screw the gnomes. We're not doing that. We're not going to go save them. We'll, we'll kill these dragonborn on our own, but forget the gnomes. So this is actually a group of people that branched off disobeyed orders, and went off and actually successfully freed many of the gnomes. They were not welcome back when they came home to Alheim, so they had to actually go back to near where the gnomes are, and the gnomes helped them settle their own kingdom. So they have very close relations with 
the gnome kingdom, which we'll end up seeing here in a little bit. Now, I did one video for races of Candelure on my channel so far, and I promise you I'm working on the next one, which is the Azrul or Dragonborn. But the Fallen Elves is the race that I did, and they live down here in this corner. And this is Amistir. These are the Moon Elves who were cursed basically by an evil deity a long time ago. They're the very first fallen elf actually actually was a hero, actually saved the rest of Candler from this evil deity, but he was cursed in the process, and his ancestors became the fallen elves, who are a little bit crazy. Um, they've kind of got madness running through their blood, so they were kicked out of the elven kingdoms, and they had to settle in these swamps and forests down here in what is now known as Amistir. The final kingdom is the largest. This area is known as Aldesta. It is a huge desert. Uh, it's got canyons, cliffs, all of that. It's actually got the mountains, or the side of this mountain range here. This is the gnomes. This is the gnome kingdom of Aldesta. Aldesta is a very interesting place because the gnomes are very progressive in Candelure. They are progressive in technology and in their thinking. So they're going to have, they're going to be more of the tinker gnomes versus like the forest type gnomes. Um, but they're going to have cities where it's almost a democracy. It's, uh, I guess you could call it a republic in most of Aldesta, where the citizens have a say, they, ha they elect representatives, and think, think back to basically ancient Greece with philosophers sitting you know, in white robes on fountains, giving speeches about life and all that, and that's exactly what the gnomes do. So very progressive in their thought, as well as, like I said, they have very advanced technology. They have used magic to, to really enhance their daily lives, but they're very weary of sharing that with other kingdoms. So this is definitely a place like ancient Greece, um, and they also, with that progressive thought, they obviously have no, no slavery at all. They were enslaved at one point, so they're very against that. But at the same time, they also do not allow any types of spell casting or magic that would basically dominate a person or charm a person. You cannot cast magic to take away someone's free will in Aldesta, um, or there are steep, steep penalties. So that is Aldesta. Now, the last one is not a kingdom, it's just an area. This other island over here, basically this other landmass, this is the Forgotten Lands, also known as the Aralai Dominions. Now, no civilizations associated with Candelure exist over here. There is one city or one town called Serenity. Serenity is an outpost uh, along the coast. And I believe, if I zoom all the way in on it, I believe I have it set it's one of these two areas right along in here on the coast. But this is where people from Candelure can come over here and actually join in ranging missions to go learn more about this area. But it's very dangerous because you have these hordes of wild creatures, actually known as the wild, um, some of them, like gnolls, orcs. Um, you've actually got rogue dragonborn over here. And they kind of run the northern half of this landmass. In the southern half, there is a huge drow city way underneath the surface. Um, I believe it's pronounced Aralai Sinlu or something like that. It's an actual drow city in like the Forgotten Realms or something. Um, but in my setting, it's actually going to be placed way underground over here somewhere. So drow raiding parties actually hit the surface a lot. And that is part of why the Dragonborn failed their invasion is because they tried to take this landmass also. 
and got decimated by these raiding parties. So that's kind of the breakdown of the entire map of Candelure. Obviously, there's an island over here. At this point, it's just kind of a freebie uh, where I don't have anything planned for it. But that is my favorite kind of map making, where you leave the map unfinished or undetailed, I guess. You'll also notice that I like to leave areas where it heads off the paper. So up here, up here a little bit, right up there, and down here. So there's always possibilities that this land extends further, or maybe it just ends right after the map. But I like to leave that, leave that open. The rest of the time, we're going to focus on the Elven Kingdom of Kandara Thane with some of these other exercises in a little bit. So let's end the screen share. All right, welcome back. I'm going to check the comments really quickly on my phone here. See if there's any issues. I don't see any major issues like tech issues or anything, so that's good. So what we're going to do is talk about really quickly my world building process. I talk about it a lot. It changes quite often. So what I start out with is a map. I want to start out with that overall, that overview map that I showed you. I revise it as I go. Don't ever get married to your ideas. You always want to be able to break away and change things. Start with the map. Then I break it down and I say, OK, are there different nations or different kingdoms? Um, always going back to the theme that I have in mind or the major inspirations that you have in mind. From there, from that big picture, people always talk about you know world building out and then down, you know, then zoom. Or people always talk about starting with building your way out. I'm kind of in and out all the time. So I start with that big map, then I zoom into one of those kingdoms and I build out from there. So if you picture a a pond and it's just sitting nice and still, I create basically the borders of the pond. And then I throw in rocks. So rock is a city. You throw it in the pond, it ripples out. And however it influences the things around it, there's no stopping that. So that's basically what I'm doing is I'm throwing rocks at this map and just kind of rippling out from each place. So that's the process that I use. I don't ever want it, like I said at the start of the video, I don't ever want it completely detailed all the way out before the campaign starts. Leave plenty of things unfinished. Just know enough that when players ask a question, you can answer it. Or when something major happens, you know how it affects other areas. That's all you need to know. So for Kandara Thane, that is where I'm really, really world building right now. I'm not worrying about Alheim. I'm not worrying about Aldesta, where the gnomes are. I know the overall look and where the cities are there, and that's all I need at this point. Um, I will wait until the players get there to actually start to really detail things out. But that's my process. It's a continual process that goes through the length of the entire campaign, and it allows not only myself to keep building it throughout the campaign, but it allows the players to actually have an influence and build with you. If you finish everything out, there's nothing left for them to really do uh, except hang out in this world. Along with that, real quick, DM tip is you've got to sell your create it. You can create the perfect, really, really fun world, but if you don't sell it the right way, players aren't going to care. So if your players are not into big, lengthy descriptions that take you six minutes to get through, don't do that for your world. Instead, show them, if they like combat, show them through combat how your world is different, how the creatures of your world are different. If they like talking to NPCs or through politics, show them that way. You don't always have to sit and come up with pages and pages of description. I can't do that. I... I make small paragraphs, so like three or four sentences, 
that's the most like description, like detailed written out description that I will give at a time. Just because as a player, I do like that lore, but it's hard for me to sit and really listen to somebody else's world for that long. So I understand their side of it. So that's just a quick tip. Understand your players so that you're better able to sell them on the world that you created. Now, got my little notes here. So that was a that was the world building overview. The quick rundown of the process that I take to world build. Now remember, if anybody has questions, go ahead and throw them into the Q&A app on here and we will get those answered closer to the end of the video. So let's start with relations among nations. So this is an exercise that you can actually take part in because I like to do that with coffee and campaign building. So we're gonna talk about the nations of Candelure or the kingdoms, all seven of them, and how they relate to one another. We're gonna keep it very simple and very quick. If you don't have that many kingdoms or nations, in your setting, let's say it's just one kingdom, then go ahead and break it down even smaller and just choose cities. And how do those cities affect one another? How do they have relations with one another? So I'm gonna screen share a spreadsheet here. And I'm gonna take you through this process that I use that can be very helpful, hopefully for you as well. Okay, I think we're good to go. All right, so uh, hopefully you guys can see this really, really well. What I'm gonna do first is I'm actually going to I'm gonna do this. There's probably a better way to do this, but we're gonna start here and I'm gonna start with Alheim, a kingdom of dwarves and men that I talked about. Now, for Alheim, well, subtracting Alheim, there are six other kingdoms. So I'm going to start with Aramanthir, who created Arathel, Indarathane, Stormfall, Amistir, and Aldesta. And we'll go ahead and do this for just maybe one or two of my kingdoms. So we don't have to sit through all seven. But what I'm going to do is choose one or two words that describe how this kingdom, our highlighted one up here, let's put it in a box, how this kingdom thinks or what that kingdom thinks of all of these other ones. So Alheim the relationship or what they think of Aramanthir is they think that Aramanthir is unorganized. Aramanthir is progressive, remember. They, you know, they got rid of basically they don't allow men to rule, which Alheim is very traditional, so obviously the men there are going to be the rulers. So they see Aramanthir as a very unorganized system that doesn't really know what it wants. So you've got to take into account and think, okay, well, how does that affect you know trade and things like that? Well, it really doesn't. Um, they're not going to set up huge deals with Aramanthir or risk a lot on trade deals with Aramanthir because of that unorganized viewpoint but it's not going to be a huge negative to where they will just completely like not interact with that nation as you'll see on a different one. So let's, let's actually go to Stormfall because this is kind of the, the extreme. Now remember Stormfall broke away from Alheim a long, long time ago. So Alheim actually has hatred towards Stormfall. Let's make these italicized. There we go. Solheim actually has hatred towards Stormfall. Simple as that. And remember, with this exercise, uh, I hope you're doing it at the same time, at least with one, two, or three cities or something. 
Uh, but remember to keep these very short. We're not writing a page on the actual relations between these different nations. So they have a hatred towards Stormfall. So as you can guess, there is zero trade between those two kingdoms. Now, it also comes down to currency. I've been working a lot with the different currencies. I'm using gold, silver, and copper, but they are called different things and worth different amounts in different kingdoms. So we won't get into that today, but as you can imagine, if you bring Stormfall money into Alheim and you want to you, you want to trade it out for, you know, Alheim's equivalent, you're actually going to receive heavy, heavy, heavy taxation on that. Uh, so it's not a very fair trade coming in and trying to switch out your money from Stormfall. It's that deep of a hatred for that nation. No one breaks away from the perfect traditions of Alheim, basically, in their, in their eyes. So then we'll go with Alheim's view of Aldesta. Now, Aldesta, you know, the gnomes, very progressive. Um, they actually helped found Stormfall. But they don't have quite as much of a hatred for Aldesta because Aldesta is this huge kingdom, big population, resources that a lot of other places don't have with that, you know, desert and canyon region. So they actually view Aldesta um, as a competitor or we'll say rival, just in trade, basically. Um, military might, Alheim is pretty darn good. So they see it as a, what should we say, trade rival? That might be better. So they still trade with Aldesta. They want to keep a close eye on everything out of there, um, but they are this rival, and they obviously always remember that they help Stormfall because Aldesta has good relations with Stormfall. So this is a trade rival, and you could even say that they're very cautious towards it. That would be another one. I'll leave that one there. Okay, we've got three left. Now, Arathel, which was founded by Aram and Thir, Alheim basically sees Arathel as kind of this uh, almost like a side project, if you will. They realize that Araminthir founded another kingdom, which is just unheard of. You know, why would you set up another kingdom that you do not end up ruling over? Um, you help start another kingdom and basically create another rival as Alheim sees it. So they see Arathel as kind of this uh, the way to see it would be like an annoying sibling. Do you know when you go to a friend's house and they've got that little brother that just won't leave you alone or that little sister that's just annoying? That's what Alheim is seeing Arathel as. Um, Arathel is an established kingdom with rulers, with a decent amount of power. They've got a military. And so they are involved in all these talks and all these trades, uh, but it's more annoying than anything to Alheim that this kingdom created out of thin air is part of everything. So let's jump back to Amistir. Amistir is the fallen elves, if you remember. Now, they are mad. They're chaotic. They're crazy. And so Alheim is going to see them um, as that. Mad and crazy. So they do set up very small trades because there are some very rare things that come out of the swamps in Amistir. So they do set up these small trades with them, but they would never, you know, sign a, like an alliance with them or they would never trust them for anything because of this madness. And you'll see that Amistir is, I mean, you feel sorry for them. No one really trusts them, um, rightfully so. So they're just kind of off on their own most of the time. And Alheim and Kindarathane, so the kingdom of the elves. 
this is a very interesting relationship. This, you could almost say, is an ancient rivalry. So my campaign will start with a prologue, as I've said before, where the players get to play these super high-level heroes for one night. And the event that they see is actually inspired by Matt from A Fistful of Dice. He actually wrote something, uh, I think it's called like The Falling Star. It's in the Adventure Hooks book that came out for Brigade Con. I'm basically going to use that hook as the prologue. And these this group of adventurers sees the army of dwarves from Alheim marching towards where the star fell. They, they want it for, you know, whatever resources. And then the elves are marching from Kendara Thane uh, towards it from the other side. And the party basically has to decide, what are we going to do? As this group of high-level heroes, our decision here is going to influence this world and the rest of this campaign that we start with, you know, first-level characters. What are we going to do in this situation? Anyways... So that just highlights kind of that rivalry. They've always rivaled each other because they were the first two kingdoms and the first two groups of people in Candelure, the Moon Elves and then the Men and Dwarves of Alheim. So they do respect one another. Uh, both have very strong militaries. They both trade with one another, uh, but they've gone to war multiple times. So... It's kind of a, a back and forth, if you will. So that is what Alheim thinks of all of these different kingdoms, basically. And that's going to influence, I can keep this page, and I can, every decision made down the line, I can always come back here and be like, okay, so if Stormfall does this in the world, you know, how's that going to affect Alheim? Well, okay, Alheim... I can see here, Alheim actually hates Stormfall, so this would happen. So it's just a good, good way to keep track of those relationships between kingdoms. So what we're going to do next, I'm going to pick one more. We're going to pick Aldesta. And we're not going to go through all of them. Okay, We're just going to go through and pick three other kingdoms the three major kingdoms, as I call them. So Araminthir, and it's going to be Alheim and Kandarathane. These are the oldest kingdoms in Candelure. So it's the three that we'll go through to shorten up this exercise. So if you've got some more cities to do, let's go ahead and keep doing those um, as we're doing this. And if you get any ideas, like if you see, for instance, if you're like, I really like the idea of that annoying little brother that won't leave you and your friends alone, use that, you know, just put that between two of your cities and that's going to make for an interesting thing. Um, in this hobby, take ideas from everywhere. If you don't plan on publishing your material, then, you know, take, 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 use, make it your own. Don't just straight up copy exactly what it is. Um, but take, I mean, I do not plan on publishing this ever. So go for it. So Aldesta, what does Aldesta think of Aramanthir? Well, they actually have a great respect. Because Aramanthir is one of the more progressive nations, as I said. They elected the that queen leader, um, basically saying men can never hold the highest position within the kingdom. They are welcoming races that are looked down upon by everyone else um, into their new nation that they created of Arathel, and basically helping Arathel become a home for those people. So Aldesta has a very high respect for Araminthir. Now, for Alheim, they see Alheim as this, this power, um, this ancient power that has always been around, you know, refuses to really change with the times, too much tradition. 
So they see Alheim as this kind of rigid, um, how do I want to even say this, this unmoving force. And that might be a good way to actually say it. So at this point, all, Aldesta has given up all hope of trying to persuade Alheim into their more progressive ways of thinking. But they recognize that Alheim is going to be around for a long, long time. So they're, they're just this, this unmoving force that they're just going to have to deal with. Um, so they, like I said, they trade with them because they benefit. And they're very smart with that. Now, what does Aldesta think of Kendara Thane? Well, the elves stick pretty much to themselves. They allow trade to come up the Red Road from Aldesta. Um, it's called the Red Road because the red dirt from the deserts of Aldesta has tracked itself all the way along the road throughout Candelure. So that's why it's called the Red Road. Because you can see up in Alheim that that road even has some red in it um, that's come all the way from Aldesta. So they respect Kindarthane. They appreciate that Kindarthane allows trade. But at the same time, these elves are very hard to deal with. Kind of like Alheim, um, but they're, it's not so much a tradition thing as they're very wild. I mean, the moon elves are, you don't just walk into a moon elf city unwelcome. You might get killed that way. So I guess the way that they would see, they would almost be cautious. That would be another way to put it. Cautious of Kendarathane. Again, plenty of trade going between the two. Um, but these elves, you never know what they're up to. You never know. You know, they can be perfect with you one minute, and then a, a star falls from the heavens, and then they're marching on your territory to take it. So they've seen that happen up in northern Candler, so they're just very, very cautious of Kendara Thane. So again, as you can see, especially for those of you just tuning in, we took a kingdom, we took one of the seven kingdoms, and then we said what it thinks of the other six in one or two words, keeping it very, very short. And that's the descriptions here. And then I just did it again in a smaller example by using three other kingdoms. So this is a very good exercise for your world building because, like I said, it really helps you to flesh out and put to paper what you're probably already thinking. You probably know a lot of these in your mind, and you know what this kingdom thinks of that kingdom, but when you put it to paper, it gives you more ideas. Um, it, number one, it takes that, you don't have to hold on to that thought, which sounds weird, but at the same time, when you can just write it down, you tend to move on to other things easier. Don't ever try to just world build and hold everything in your head. It's That's just a disaster waiting to happen. So put it to paper, use that exercise. I hope some of you actually did some of that with me while I was doing it um, because i that's the first time I'd actually written any of those down. Um, so that's why, as you could see, my process of trying to think about that relationship and what is a word or what are two words that really describe the relationship, that helps to flesh everything out and it gives you good tools to use in the future when coming back and seeing how different decisions in the campaign would affect other cities or other nations. So that is our little world building exercise called Relations Among Nations. Next up, what we're going to do is actually look at an actual city. I'm going to show you my Obsidian Portal page for an almost finished city of Destiny's Point. And what, what am I writing down for cities? What am I putting to paper as I say? for this city. And then maybe it'll give you ideas on what things do I need to write down before players are going to visit a city. So keep in mind, before I screen share this, this is the city Destiny's Point in Arthane, which is stuck in the middle of Candelure. This is the campaign is going to start. Not the prologue, but the actual session one with the player characters 
level zero, that's where it starts. So let's screen share that. Well, let's screen share it now. Here we go. Okay, so welcome to Destiny's Point. For those of you that don't know, Obsidian Portal, I talk about it a lot. It's one of my favorite websites for tabletop games. It's just a basically a fancy wiki page setup. Uh, I'm on the free account right now. I need to re-up my membership, but it, you can set it up for free and basically make a page within a new page, within a new page, you know, how wikis work. But I could put my custom background, which is kind of my my theme picture, as I call it, of Candelure. Let's see if we can see it. There we go. That's the, the shot that basically inspired this setting. So what do I have on a city or town's page? Destiny's Point. Got the name. Got a picture. And then a real quick snippet at the top to get the players interested, but not too much. Follow the river innocence into the dark and magical woods of the forest of the ancients, and you will reach Destiny's Point. It is not a part of the realm of Kandara Thane. It actually exists as a means of trade for other kingdoms and is overwatched only by the local authorities. The elves of Kandara Thane respect this. Travelers not wanting to upset the elves must take the red road to and through Destiny's Point. There's the picture. Now for all of my cities, I love to have a picture. Whether I draw it myself as a map, because I'm not talented enough to draw a picture like this, whether I draw a map or I find a picture online, that's what I go with. And I base the city off of that picture. Population, 1,426. Government, almost all decisions go through the town elder Nicodemus. Defenses, towering trees stand. You know, it's got the natural cliff face. I talk about how there's about 50 guards. They rotate shifts. There's only 12 on duty at a time. And the leader of the town guard is Brath. He is an NPC we will take a look at here in just a little bit. But then I talk about commerce. So trade goods such as lumber, food, and herbs from around the deep woods. Pushing for small game. Some even hunt for the legendary shadow elk. Now, this is just kind of a cool legend to have, like a local rumor. But the shadow elk is another page, which I could open, and it should take you there. Yep. So the shadow elk. Right now, it's just a picture. But I talk about that commerce. Upriver, goods come from northern Candelure. The biggest import from downriver is stone from the quarries in Aldesta. Other imports include treasured shipments of glass and jewels that arrive from the cradled coast by caravan. These are the more important things right here. You want to know those other details like the size of the city, the defenses, what goods do they have. But this is what's really going to affect players and their decisions. I come up, I basically have the rule of three. I want to identify three organizations in every town or city. The Storm Priests, the Tranquil Hunters, and the Order of Sael. The Storm Priests are a religious organization worshiping Kord, storm god and lord of battle. They pray for good weather along the Red Road trade, And they also press, and that's just a picture of what one of their followers would look like. This just talks more about them. I won't go into detail there. And then I have a rule down below in the GM only section, so I can see this, but no one else can. They charge two gold pieces per day per weather shift. So if players want good weather, they can come, they can pay uh, to say, we want sunny weather for our travels. The priest will then write the prayer on blessed papyrus paper, bury the bones of an enemy of cord, and burn the paper on top of that dirt pile. 
this doesn't always work. Um, but that is an option that they can try and then they've got a better chance at the weather they want than had they not done it. The Tranquil Hunters, group of hunters and rangers that return to the Storm Spire to sell their furs, meats, and other goods. So this is just a symbol for them that I wanted to have. And we'll talk about the Storm Spire in a minute. That is in Destiny's Point. Then the Order of Sail, a monastic order with a holding within the Storm Spire. The main monastery is in the heart of Candelure, which is in the northern section. And certain monks come to the Storm Spire at specific points during their training. So, monks. So, I've got three interesting organizations and what they do around the area. And then I've also got three nearby places. So, blue on my wiki means that the page has not actually been created yet. So, I have not finished the page for these, but I know what they are. The Old Veiled Keep is across the river, and it's this old castle that's worn down. Um, there's plenty of rumors to go along with it. Havern's Camp is a military camp that's uh, a couple miles down the Red Road. And then the Red Road Sanctum is a holy site also further down the Red Road. But this creates three interesting places that the characters can visit. You don't just want the city, you want something surrounding that city for adventure sites or places that can have their own hooks for adventures. And I always start with at least three of those. Now in town, I have a section on in town, uh, interesting locations in town to visit. So in Destiny's Point, it's pretty much this giant spire. There are other buildings and houses and shops and things, but most Everything happens in the Storm Spire. The towering structure consists of three major pieces built into the central cliff, the lowest level being the Arium. This is where you find indoor markets and specialty organizations. Sitting atop the Arium is the ship Destiny, for which the town is named. And if you look at the picture, there is a ship built out kind of over the river. Oops. The middle level um, of a, the middle level above that is the location of the temples and the higher offices of merchants and of the organizations. Now, the top of the storm spire is known as Storm Spire Point. This is where the town elder Nicodemus resides with his libraries. That would be all the way up here on the picture. So, in other towns, this might have names of certain um, inns and taverns. For instance, I should have on here something called the Inn of Good Faith. That is where they're going to start the campaign. And in the GM only, I talk a little bit more about the that ship. Legend has it that a hero known only as the Sword of Destiny sailed the ship Destiny from the Vega K, which is the water between the two land masses and up the river Innocence on his way back from the Forgotten Lands. He wrecked it upon the rocks, and his crew then built Destiny's Point. I've also got three other nearby places that are a little bit higher level, so I'm going to hide them for now. The Dendar's Ziggurat, Grey Death's Tomb, and Sedonaya's Grove. The Dendar Ziggurat. Deep within the forests, the ancients travelers have spoken about lights and sounds coming from the hidden ziggurat northeast of Destiny's Point. Yuan T, however you say it, have dedicated this ziggurat and their dark rituals to Dendar the Night Serpent. So, uh, this is going to be a very interesting storyline if they want it. If they don't want it, then Destiny's Point could be in trouble. Grey Death's Tomb is not finished yet. Sedaniah's Grove. Across the River Innocence is this grove. Basically, it's a mysterious place. Children of the town are always saying that that's where their nightmares come from. And they speak of somebody named Sedaniah. To tell you, the viewers, the truth, 
Sedonaya is a supremely evil and powerful night hag that lives within that grove. But the players don't know that. Okay, so that is how I lay out a town. That is pretty much everything I have for the towns. Uh, the only thing I would add, obviously, are the in-town section would be a bit longer on most towns. I just put some interesting points, and I put a, quite a bit here. You could honestly put one or two sentences for each location. Like, it is a popular inn among sailors. And something else. Maybe they have really good stew. That's all you really need for each location. All right. What we're going to do next is go to characters, take a quick look at some NPCs, and then I will get to some questions. So, um, players created here. Quick rundown. Brath, leader of the town guard. Lacadia is the cook at the Inn of Good Faith. This is a different lady for a different area. Nicodemus is that leader of the town. Um, let's start actually down here. So for the Patreon that I'm doing with the map making, at certain levels of the Patreon, you can create NPCs, and I will kind of highlight them and do my best to come up with really cool stories in my campaign with them. And one of the patrons at one of the higher levels got to actually create kind of a heroic NPC. So he created Sammy Bigfoot. And Sammy's going to play a big role in the campaign because he's a really cool character, actually. He's basically this black market thief uh, merchant. And he's got a very interesting backstory. We won't go into it right now. But he's also got an assistant basically a uh, mercenary loyal to him named Tug. And Tug is a huge half-orc. So Sammy Bigfoot and Tug, I'm very excited for. Um, in the campaign, like I said, this, this patron kind of blew me away, actually, with the NPCs he came up with. So those two are going to play quite a big role in a different city. But let's focus on Brath. So what the players can see at this point is Brath, leader of the town guard. Normally I would have one or two sentences, maybe about what he looks like or what common knowledge is about him. And then hidden information, this is exactly what your dungeon master's guide for fifth edition leads you through, uh, where it talks about creating an NPC. And if I'll try to get the page number here for you, but I went exactly through everything that they said for this one. So creating or designing NPCs is page 89 of 5th edition Dungeon Master's Guide. And these are the exact steps that they tell you to take. So I did it. I'm going to try it out. It's a little bit shorter than what I used to use, which is always good because I need to trim back a little bit on just how much I'm putting on these NPCs because I don't use a lot of it. So occupation and history, he's leader of the town guard in Destiny's Point, and he gained his experience from 15 years fighting for the heroic. Now, the heroic and the wild. Basically, the Alliance and the Horde from World of Warcraft. Not quite as prominent. It's actually kind of a forgotten war. There's very small factions still loyal to it, but... That's kind of what that is. Got his appearance, his abilities, his talent. He actually speaks a lot of languages. He's constantly brushing back his shoulder length hair. Interactions with others. He's respectful when speaking with strangers, but if you're in the military and you're a lower rank, he's quite commanding. He's aware of the immediate threats around Destiny's Point. Uh, but he's also aware of a fight that occurred on the docks the other night that resulted in one man losing a tooth. Just something fun that could make for a real quick quest. Ideal. His ideal would be his responsibility to protecting Destiny's Point. His bond is that he's, uh, he's extremely loyal to Nicodemus, who keeps him in his position. 
Uh, Nicodemus always seems to find the money and the resources to keep Brath where he's at. And for a flaw or secret, his flaw would be his fear of orcs and orc-like creatures from his days fighting them in the heroic versus the wild. So there's actually Ettons that have kind of blocked a path through the mountains nearby. And he's kind of ignoring that threat um, because it hasn't directly affected Destiny's point yet, but they're similar to orcs. I mean, they have similar features and they're frightening and he's actually scared enough to confront that threat. So let's take a look at Nicodemus real quick. Same type of thing. He's unfinished as of now, but there's a picture of him. He's got he's the town elder or sage, tan wrinkled skin, full white hair flowing to his shoulders, and a long white beard. This is actually my old setup. Very, very similar to the Dungeon Master's Guide, um, but I'm going to change it over. So... If you're on Obsidian Portal, a quick tip if you're creating characters, create something called a test character. And what I have put under the test character is all of those things from the Dungeon Master's Guide plus what the Dungeon Master's Guide describes it as. So I can literally copy this, paste it into the character I create, and then one by one I can go through and fill them out. Uh, and if I forget what they are, I also have exactly what the book says. So that's what I do. All right, so drinks still hot. That's surprising. So we've looked at my world building process. We've looked at Candelure, kind of an overview. We've looked at the relations among the nations. We looked at a city. We looked at an NPC. I want to give one more thing that I forgot to mention about Candelure, and then we're going to answer questions. The setting has an interesting thing that happened where the gods have stopped answering prayers, basically. The gods have gone silent. They, for whatever reason, they're no longer answering prayers. Priests and clerics have no idea what's going on. The only mentions of things happening like this in history are when a god was killed. So they wonder if somehow a god was not murdered in Candelure or something to do with Candelure because they're getting reports from other parts of the world, you know, worlds away, but they've had reports that the gods are not silent everywhere. The gods are not just gone but they've almost turned their back on Candelure. Now, they're not acknowledging this to the general public, but the public has started to, to gather this information. So there's rumors that the gods have abandoned them. And in place of... of you, well, now you, for now, for instance, you've got fanatics everywhere. Some fanatics uh, saying that the gods are gone. They're abandoning everyone into the world. Some of them are fanatics for certain gods um, saying, you know, you are spouting um, nonsense. You are actually offending the gods by saying they abandoned us. Think if you've played Skyrim, think of the crazy, crazy guy in Whiterun. And those are the kind of people that they're going to find in a lot of cities. That guy who's constantly just shouting. Um, very, very cool character. I think just a neat thing to have in a town, but some people are worshiping one God in public. And then in their private homes, they have shrines to other gods because they are scared that their God is no longer answering. And they've heard that this other God is actually helping people. So they're secretly worshiping that God. And then you have this interesting dynamic of people have now turned to the angels for guidance for certain angels and let me find i'll share the pictures of these okay so this is another example of finding interesting things on the internet taking them and using them for your campaign 
So I present to you, his name is, or I think it's Peter Moorbacher, something like that. It's patreon.com slash angelarium. And I'm sure many of you have seen his artwork. It's fantastic. And it's these angels, these divine emanations. Um, I'm just going to use their pictures and some of his descriptions in my game. But let me screen share that. So for instance, people are turning and worshiping or praying to angels now, um, some people. And these are the examples. The Angel of Annihilation, it's a very cool one. The Angel of, let's do the Angel of Vengeance. This is the front picture, I think, of his Patreon page. And then these are the actual words that he has kind of released with uh, the pictures. So it's just very, very cool descriptions, amazing interpretations of these angels. Uh, he actually talks about how these are based on ancient real texts in our world uh, mixed with our experiences in life is what he's saying. Uh, that's his inspiration for these pictures. But I had to find a way to incorporate them. Angel of memory. Anyways, I just, there's such beautiful pictures that I had to include them some way in my game. The angels are not going to play a, a big, big role, but some people are going to, you know, NPCs are going to be talking about, oh, you should really, you know, the angel of song or the angel of night is coming or something like that. And it's just going to be a nice flavor to add to things with some fantastic artwork. Um, with artwork in my games, what I do is I will actually put it up on a TV next to me. I will kind of organize folders and then use either like an Apple TV device or a lot of smart TVs now you can uh, just show pictures on. So I will do that because I like to give descriptions, but I'll give a quick description and then toss the picture up. Like Destiny's Point, you know, talk about those hundred foot trees. It's built into a cliff face with a rushing river going by. Boom, pop up that picture of Destiny's Point. If you pop it up first, no one's going to listen to your description. So I do love to use pictures of people and places in the game so they can actually see with their eyes. Because some people, people learn in three different ways. Seeing, hearing, and I think it's feeling the other one. Experiencing. Anyways, try to incorporate those into your game. That could be a whole other video. Um, question time. Let's move on from Candelure and dive into some questions. So if you have any, now's the time to toss them into the Q&A app on the video. Click on the Join the Conversation thing, and you can jump in there. But I'm also going to try to thread through the comments on my phone to see if there were any there. Oh, yeah, we might have some. Question in Q&A. Let me select it. How exactly, this is from Lynx Panda, how exactly do you come up with names? Do you use a random generator or do you generally come up with them yourself? I have a lot of trouble with names. So the best thing that you can do for names, and I've talked about this in a, quite a few videos that aren't, weren't necessarily about this. Um, so for instance, on your phone, you start a notepad sheet or uh, to carry an actual notepad with you, some, something you're always going to have with you. And I've got a brainstorming sheet that I've talked about in here. You cannot see it at all. Let me screen share it because I do have it on my drive. What you're going to do is you're going to take names from everywhere. Anytime a cool name happens to pop into your head, write it down. The biggest lie is that so if it's a good idea, you don't need to write it down because you'll always remember it. Baloney. Write down everything. Oh, let's see. Here we go. So I'm going to share, screen share this to show you, and then I'll keep talking about it. All right. What you're going to notice here 
is that I've got a bunch of words, words and names. And over the course of a couple of months, I would write them down and I would see them everywhere. So Amos uh, was a name, I'm sure, in a book somewhere. I was like, that'd be cool. I just want to have an NPC named that. Torian, the bard, wrote that down. He's a character. Uh, Geralion could be a city or a person. Thraxis Thrain, uh, Mergandus. Some of these I did just come up with myself. And so then I wrote them down because I would have forgotten them. Other ones are just words. I would go through and find words that you think are really, really cool, uh, like ancient or tower, canyon. I wanted to incorporate those somewhere. So you could have something called like Canyon of the Gods, uh, which I took from a D&D documentary. Um, other ones, Brath. Uh, I thought that that was really, really cool. I, and again, I can't even remember where I got it from. I probably combined two other words because I do that a lot. Uh, I saw something about Valley Forge, and I was like, okay, I'm going to break those up, and I'm going to use those separately. A dream Tree. So there's a bunch there. Um, I've got a bunch further down. Oh, let's see here. I've shown these before. I wanted something, the blank coast. Uh, the cradle of civilization is always a really cool phrase that I've liked. So I wrote that down. And then I was like, wait a second. I want something, the blank coast. Why not the cradled coast? And that's how I came up with the cradled coast. But absolutely any time. Okay, Arendelle. I want to say that this is actually from Frozen. Is this from Frozen? I was watching some YouTube video, and they were talking about it, and they said Arendelle, and I was like, you know, that's a really cool name. Arendelle, so I wrote it down. I was like, I'm not going to use that, you know, straight out of that. But then from there, I just started messing around with it, and I actually came up with Arethel, and that's how I came up with that word. So to answer your question, I do come up with a lot of them myself. For certain races, I will use name generators. For instance, I'm designing a couple different templates for the monster from the monster manual, the sprite, um, like a sprite champion and all these, these other harder variations to fight. And I realized I don't really have any good names for those. And so I went in and I wrote down a bunch of names for sprites and I wrote them down. I've got that page here. I won't share it, but I'll just read those. So there's a lot of websites. Just Google. I think I Googled like Sprite Name Generator, D&D, &D, or something like that. And it came up to some Fey Name Generator. So use tons of those. Um, Aid, Elm, Shade, Aiden, Barrel, Opal, Isle, Lauren. Those are all from a Sprite Name Generator somewhere. Um, so with names, you really do have to just take them where you can get them. There are a lot of links that I, I'll try to share where I've got one. It's like 4,000 fantasy names. So maybe what I'll try to do is put a link either on my Facebook page or in the description here as well. I'll try to find that and then share that uh, to everyone. But that is... That, I mean, it's, I printed it because I thought it was like a couple of pages of names and it printed like 16 pages and they're awesome, awesome names for fantasy. So the biggest tip you always hear is take two words, smash them together and you've got a fantasy name. So that's a great way to do it. Take real life locations like the Vega K, which is the watery region between the two land masses of Candelure. I was actually working at a real estate place and looking up certain properties and there's a place in like South Carolina called like the Tega K or something. And I was like, that just sounds cool. And then I was like, but how can I make that something else? And so I started thinking like the something K that doesn't sound good. The, this K that doesn't sound good. So like I wanted it to sound close to the same, and so all of a sudden I was like, Vega, uh, Street Fighter, is it Street Fighter? Yeah, Street Fighter. I was like, Vega, Vega K. That just sounds cool. So I use that. So that's how I do names. 
So I hope that answers that question. Um, going through the comments here. Sorry, I'm on my phone. It's just easier to pull up the comments. Go through quickly. Oh, I think I found one. Did you have any real world inspiration for your nations? Now, on my phone, I can't see your entire comment, so I hope the question ends right there. Yes, um, real world inspiration, as I mentioned, for Aldesta especially, that was, I was like, I want Tinker Gnomes. I've talked with Matt before about Tinker versus Forest Gnomes, and I like the Tinker ones better, personally. But I was like, they're very progressive in their magic. Why would they not be progressive in their thought and in their government? And so I was like, yeah. So I was looking through the governments in the Dungeon Master's Guide, and I was like, okay, Republic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This sounds good. And then instantly it hit me, like ancient Greece and like the philosophers and kind of that system. And that's, boom, that is how I came up with basically everything else. They're going to dress like that. They're going to gather around fountains outside. They're going to cast votes by putting stones in. Um, I think that was from the Dungeon Master's Guide. But So that is some real-world inspiration. Now, I'm trying to think of the other nations, if there was any obvious sources. Not so much. I'm sure that real-world sources had inspired me to come up with other things, but that would be the closest, like, direct inspiration. So next one here. Um, so did the picture come first, and you wrote the ship into the lore, or was the ship already there, and you found the commissioned a picture with it? No, I found the picture. I knew I wanted the name Destiny's Point. I knew mostly what the city was going to be like. And then I found a picture that just looked amazing and looked perfect for that. And so the ship came after that. The ship came from the picture. And I do that with a lot of my pictures. I will find a good picture that matches what I'm looking for. And then I will look at the picture further and say, okay, what can I now take from this picture? So... The idea for the city came, followed by the picture, followed by more ideas. Let's see. How much have you prepared beforehand, and how much has been influenced by actual sessions and player backgrounds? OK. I'm assuming you mean for the actual setting itself. So that's what I will answer. Um, everything that I have told you guys so far, everything that I've talked about in this video here is stuff that I have come up with mostly on my own. However, I have run a lot of ideas by players. I've run a lot of ideas by the players that will play in this campaign. I said, you know, what, you know, what do you guys think about a lot of different nations? Because our last one, it was one big empire they were all playing in. I was like, what if we break it up in this next campaign? And we had like six or seven different kingdoms that you're going throughout. And they all love that idea. So I run ideas by them like that. Um, and then I get a general basis for the whole world. So I know what each kingdom is about. I know the names and locations of the major cities, um, how trade works, but then I really only detail that first starting place all the way down. So that's Destiny's Point. And from there, I know how their actions would influence other places because I know what those other places are like, but I'm not going to go ahead and detail everything out because I want to leave things open for them to be able to influence through their actions. Um, now, when we do player backgrounds as well, a lot of that is going to play in and it's going to change things. 
So the major things I'm going to keep, but if I have to get rid of an idea or a concept to better bring a player's background into it, I will do that. That's something that's very hard to do as a DM. And this is probably the first campaign where I've really been willing to let that happen. And I think that's going to play out a lot better um, because you've got to let the players have their fun with the world too. Uh, When the campaign actually starts, they have access to the Obsidian portal. So they can actually create pages. They could create, let's say they create their background on their character page. If they're from this small town called Jerillion or whatever, they can go ahead and create that page on Obsidian Portal. Um, they can look or ask me, what is this kingdom like? And then I tell them, and then they can create a town within it that kind of fits. So I leave quite a bit open to them. I just want to create enough of a framework to where it's almost like a spider web. Like if they pull the string here, I want things to happen over here. So that's why I create as much as I do beforehand. Um, because our very first campaign, I created basically where they were. And they're like, okay, we want to go north. And so I was like, oh, that's this kingdom. And I literally just had a name. And then they traveled there, and we fleshed it out. And that's fun. Um, but I also like world building. And so I've got to find a balance between allowing myself to build a lot of it, but also allowing the players to build a lot of it. So I hope that answers that question for you. We'll refresh this one more time here and see if we've got any others. All right, I think, and I'm sorry if I missed any questions, I will go back and answer them throughout, you know, in the actual comments and I will answer them. But I'm going to wrap it up because it's been about an hour and a half close to that, which is what I was hoping to hit. So, again, that was an overview of Candelure. There's more coming. There are more race videos. Um, the As Rule was voted to come next, so that's the Dragonborn. I want to do a few more spotlight videos on the setting itself, um, and then hopefully some more coffee and campaign building. This is one of if not the most popular series that I do on the channel, able to do more of these. So hopefully we'll see more in the future. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, It's been a lot of fun. I hope you did some world building during this. And I also want to thank everybody who's going to watch this later on on the channel. So if you do have any further questions, put them in the comments. I always try to answer every question if I can. And we will go from there. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and have a great week of gaming, everyone. Take care.